What I'm going to talk about is, um, with a background in politics, I worked in politics about 10 years in opposition <coughs> in, in government. Um, so I'm going to talk about the more political angle and dimension, obviously, to decision making. You've already heard about, I think, a lot of the pressures on the NHS and how people are suggesting that they deal with them. Um, and whatever the best laid plans and, and policy announcements, as we know from looking back at the past, uh, the political, the politics of, of health in particular, as well as other things, um, quite often a, a, a ch you know, policy decisions have changed because of political influences. And I'm just going to go through some of those today and what drives policy making, what will drive policy making in this parliament. Um, the reason that that is relevant to a commercial audience, I think, and, and I now work with um, <coughs> commercial providers advising people on the policy environment, and particularly on policy risks and prediction and, and how political trends might impact policy. And the reason that that's relevant is if you look over the last parliament, you'll see you'll seen several policy statements about what government intended to do especially involving um, the private sector, um, and then suddenly those decisions uh, you know, changing or even being reversed altogether. And I remember you know, big prison outsourcing reforms, for example, suddenly being halted because of political media pressures, very similar in, in healthcare and in the NHS, when that debate was very live. Um, so, so there's a lot of unknowns in the, in the next parliament, but what I'm going to talk about, I hope which is going to be useful, is how you can actually start to um, pretty much predict um, how policy will change and, and what the risks are to, to state policy for ministers. I'll also talk a bit about the, you know, the politics of the, of the current thinking around uh, NHS, um, how to meet its pressures, what kinds of policy we can expect. Um, so, just to kick off, I'm just going to talk about how we work with um, companies largely, but this is a model that um, I used to use in government and, and I actually developed with policymaker types over a couple of years to look at how the policymaking process works and what, what actually influences political decisions and policy decisions. And it's an incredibly wide um, range of influences sort of greater or lesser of importance. And the one that you would hope that they take decisions on is, is, is the sort of fourth one on practicality. What is that, what do we actually need? And what's practical, what will we, what will we need to deliver? Um, but, you know, press, political factors, public sentiment, at the end here, policy landscape. Um, this is campaign groups, you know, trade unions, people that are involved in, in policy debates. These all have huge, huge influences on policy and they can completely change the direction uh, of what we're seeing. And, and certainly in the last parliament, in health especially, these played a huge part in, in uh, some of what went on. I'm absolutely sure that we're going to see um, exactly the same influences in this parliament. Remember, there will be more money taken out of most parts of government apart from health, but as you've probably heard, I won't be repeat all that stuff, but the, you know, the money going in is to keep things standing still. There's a, there's a huge amount of pressure in the NHS and quite a big appetite um, to make further changes. Um, so, just to crack on, um, this is, I'm showing you slides of data, as I've done talking in human terms, but um, this is, this is um, looking over the last parliament. Remember, we had this huge rally in the NHS, and in, in the, the election, it was a big issue. And, um, Andy Burnham was saying that the Conservatives were selling the NHS and, and the Tories were saying that you know, he was talking nonsense and unions were kicking up a bit of fuss. Um, I'll show you later uh, some interesting trends about media sentiment in relation to all that, which completely um, uh, it doesn't reflect all that or that debate at all. Um, but just, just in relation to the last parliament, debates on health policy, this is in the House of Commons, where things are usually much more sensible. Um, in terms of the level of, and the degree of debate you get. Um, talking about the NHS, this is, this is in very specifically the involvement of the private sector in the NHS so in a variety of different areas like pharma, new areas, med tech. Um, uh, it includes the provision of frontline services, which was the most controversial in the media, um, in Parliament, 
didn't really take up a huge amount of time. But you can see, obviously, that for the Labour Party, it was the biggest issue, but not, not to a massive degree. And the Tories were often the ones leading debates on, on the NHS, um, and very little from the other parties. A large, and this is adjusted for their size, by the way, so this isn't, this doesn't just reflect um, uh, the, the presence in the House of Commons. Um, SNP weren't a, a factor at all in the last parliament, and that, they're obviously a massive um, factor now, and I'll, I'll just mention briefly in a second how I think that might influ influence political decision making. Um, but essentially, over that last part, we saw what, what were probably the main, what, what, what certainly ministers uh, and, and the officials actually used to say were the most ambitious reforms to forget the lands of the structural stuff, but the efficiency drive to take, try and take money out of the NHS. They tried the most sort of ambitious stuff that they thought they could, certainly the most ambitious program ever. Um, a lot of the, the kind of debate um, that ultimately started influencing decisions were actually happened in the media. Behind the scenes, um, there was a lot of appetite for, for fairly radical thinking, which I think there still is in some areas. Um, so that, that there are some issues to look out for, which I'll mention in a sec. Um, uh, but there's certainly, I think, a, a, a widespread body of opinion that the private sector in particular, and innovations, um, uh, companies like yourselves, people like yourselves, experts like yourselves, will be needed a great deal more. Um, and there's no ideological factor in that at all. It's purely the maths. Um, in, in the NHS, I, I, I have 30% in my head, I think it was, that generally when you, when you involve the private sector in um, uh, anything around delivery, technology, transfer, management even, um, there's about a 30% uplift beyond what the, the, the service would do itself at the same level of quality and cost, and that's on average. In some areas, particularly in technology, the, the advances are, are massive. Um, so, you know, it's a no-brainer that the, 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 the outside help um, of industry will absolutely be needed a whole lot more. However, you can see the kind of heat of that debate and, and, the, and the discussion provoked, even in the sort of sensible, fairly sensible um, area of the House of Commons, is rising, and that will continue to do so over this Parliament. Um, just really briefly touch on the SNP. Um, what does that mean for us when we talk about um, how politics and how political decision making will carry on? Um, of course, they're now suddenly the largest party. Um, my old colleagues, the Liberal Democrats, um, and the other government parties were uh, you know, totally hammered, completely out of the picture. Um, suddenly there's this new force. We know very obviously, and again, this is, this is another picture of um, political debate involving the SNP. We've got no great data on, you know, or, or much knowledge actually about the SNP and how they're behaving in Westminster in relation to the NHS and what goes on in England. But here's what's been going on in Scotland. You know, they're not, they're not terribly different from any other party, very similar to the other, to the other profile. Um, again, this is adjusted, they were much, by far the largest party in Scotland, and now obviously white Labour out there. And what points will they have here? Um, well, they're, they're obviously the third largest party I've said, they've vowed to oppose the Tory agenda, but we haven't yet seen any great evidence that they will um, seek to intervene in, in how the English runs its NHS other than to kind of criticise um, the, probably the use of the private sector and cuts and all the rest of it and the spending environment. Um, there, there's a debate around spending that I'm going to in relation to Scotland, but, um, and they're not on brilliant ground on that. Um, but you know, we don't think that they will have huge influence on actual policy decisions and lobbying and all of that. Um, so just to move on to um, the next bit, Public opinion has a huge influence on um, decision making, especially number 10. Um, Department of Health tends to be much more technical um, and driven by you know, local need and how, how its relationship to the NHS at large. Um, number 10 is much, much more driven by politics and the decision, uh, the influences I've just mentioned on that, that earlier slide. Um, this is net, well, I call it approval, it's all literally all negative. Uh, this is the last party, uh, last parliament, net approval on health policy. And you can see, and basically, I won't go through all the, all the stuff and just to keep it high level, but basically, the less the government talks about um, health policy, 
the more net approval went up. And this is something, again, you will see carrying on into this Parliament. They do want to have discussions, they have to discuss, have serious discussions, with, including with guys like you. Um, but we're going to, you know, at, at the very national level, it will be quite high level stuff. Um, we're, we're talking, you know, spending, value, um, the efficiency agenda led by Simon Stevens to try and depoliticise things away from Jeremy Hunt, I expect. It, it, it doesn't, doesn't make great sense to have a politician talking like a management consultant. They just, they just basically get shot down. Um, but that, that's the picture, and, and again, that is a trend line. I think we can probably expect to continue and, unless there, there are big um, problems coming through. But what, the biggest thing that that's sensitive to is spending cuts. Um, so again, this issue I mentioned earlier about driving greater efficiency out of the service and the use of the private sector probably to help drive that is going to be really, really important in, in keeping these net approval ratings up. So while the private sector is often a, a, a means to kind of create controversy around the NHS, including some of the industries that you're, you're working for, um, in terms of the most sensitive areas of public opinion, it can actually help if you, if you work in the right way with uh, policy makers, it can actually help um, get, that, get that line keep going upwards. Um, just to talk about what influences really briefly public support in particular for different kinds of change to the health service. This is stuff around um, health service reconfiguration, which we're going to hear more about um, from Simon Stevens in particular. He's already talking, and, and Jared Hunt's already talking about the need to move a lot more people from, from hospital to home, which is something people have been talking about for absolute years. But, didn't really ever deliver because it does require service reconfiguration. It does have to happen. Um, really, really basically, people are fairly fine with the idea apart from when it's in their local area. Um, and there are there are voter differences. You can see Labour are most um, opposed to it. And there are regional ones which, if you look at London and Scotland, they actually which are tend to be more left leaning. Uh, vote regions, they tend to reflect the political dynamics. It's very, very political is, is, the, is the main message from this slide. And the, and the practical application of that, when you're, uh, when you're from industry, certainly, and you're trying to propose things to the government, you know, the, the best way to talk to people about the improvements <coughs> that you want to make is at, at the local level. Um, I remember that this bit, this being absolutely true in the last parliament, and I remember the great frustration uh, in some providers um, who were saying, well, you know, I don't want to have to deal with a hundred odd different local commissioning bodies, I just want to deal with people who will procure, you know, chunks of my business, basically, because I can, I can save an entire amount of money from the NHS if you do. Um, that's a really difficult conversation to have because of these kinds of, of um, uh, trends. There, there will be more, um, in the innovation space, which is driven by at a national level, I think politicians have seen that um, trying to devolve everything to local commissioners, you know, you, you're not going to get economies of scale, especially in areas like technology transfer. So, you know, we will have to have conversations at, at, talking at a very national level. Actually, areas like technology that are much safer areas to be talking to uh, government and proposing changes and proposing new new deals with the NHS on than are, for example, um, actual hospital reconfigurations or running hospitals. Um, we, we do have a rather bizarre situation where we've got, I think, mean, one in ten of our hospitals in special measures still, and, um, you know, certainly when I, I was still working in politics, there, there was a great appetite to have um, outside experts come in and run those um, institutions, a bit like Hinching Group did when we all that all the uh, time. Um, but that, I mean, that, that kind of stuff is very controversial. However, you know, you can, if you can keep it at a local level, you will get a huge amount of noise, as you see there. But if it's not in the national public debate, um, it won't be such a drag on decision making. The big outsourcing contracts in in justice, for example, last Palm, which got completely turned around, became a national story with um, uh, prison unions and. Chris Graydon basically pulled the plug on because he just didn't want to have the hassle. Um, and that, that's something I think this part will be quite sensitive to. Um, 
media. Um, this is an interesting one because, again, net approval, if you look at this, net approval ratings, and it, by the way, media is a huge influence on, on decision making, I'll explain how I said. Um, but net approval basically follows the same pattern as um, the public opinion did. The number of stories didn't, editorial support, I don't mean the number of stories, I mean the, the tone of the editorial, is it positive, negative, critical of government? Um, the tone of the editorials changed markedly over time towards the new election, to the last election, largely because, again, the government stopped talking about um, reforms and having arguments with trade unions about um, staffing and things like that. Uh, and they started talking about dementia and, and you know, families. And, and, and again, this parliament, Jerry Hunter, who made clear that although the big priorities that he set out were all actually linked to big cost drivers in the NHS, he's talking about obesity and dementia, very personal things, where Sam Stevens is talking about reconfiguration and management consultancy stuff. Um, again, it's completely set that to continue. Um, what, what shifts media opinion from negative to positive, according to the data, is talking about um, talking about health in a, almost a consumer way. You know, um, even if it's fairly radical, like seven-day NHS, they, you know, most of them quite like that idea. Um, when, even though it's controversial with some of the staffing uh, unions, um, it's a consumer issue that people can talk about, that newspapers can talk to readers about. That's what they want to lap up. They love stories about drugs, innovative you know, drugs. They love stories about um, tech, uh, gadgets, um, things that will save people money, things that will make people's lives easier. Telehealth is always a great one to uh, give in the press. So the, you can keep the volume. The media has an insatiable appetite for stories about health. It's huge. It's, 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 um, only the Treasury handles more press. Um, but you can feed it stuff without all this consumer um, stuff. So, to again keep that keep that trend going. I think this is all negative as well, isn't it? Yes, this is all negative. But I mean, I mean, some this is a poll of polls, by the way, of all sorts of types of media. So mostly there were, there were very very critical pieces, but um, it, it's certainly softening over time, and that's continuing. Um, so again, if it, if you if you need to propose policy to decision makers, and you want to talk to decision makers about big amounts of money that you might be able to save the NHS, but you know that some interests don't like what you might be proposing, such as trade unions, uh, it is very important to talk in, in very consumer-oriented and personal terms, rather than the <coughs> management consultancy. Pushing stories through the media is a really, really powerful way um, to get that across, much more so than talking directly to politicians. The default position is often I will go and see the blowing, you know, CCG or whatever, and go and talk to them. Um, if you want to get traction behind big ideas and big savings or really innovative things, it's, it's often really good to go through the media. Um, following that, just to just to sort of run through and and um, kind of summarise really the drivers of policy making. Um, so in the, in the political sphere, remember we're right at the beginning of a parliament, so we, we've seen nothing yet. We've seen Jeremy Hunt set out some priorities. We've seen Simon Stevens say there's going to be some really tough decisions ahead. Um, we had a last parliament where the government did get battered on health for pretty much all of it apart from the last year. Um, you know, Tory party with a majority, people are thinking, oh, doesn't that mean that... Um, will get more definitive decision making. I don't think it does actually, because what you've got is a Tory party that's learned that, um, you know, remember this was a Tory, which I was a part of, a government that hadn't been in power for, whatever it was, 13 years. So slightly naive at the beginning about how to control the political agenda. Um, they're much more experienced and, and savvy about it now. And, you know, there is literally no sense in creating a massive row about structural reforms if they're going to cost you a general election, because most, most things of that scale take two terms to get through anyway. Um, so I don't think there's any great appetite to revisit the, the, the sort of lands of the era of um, not really talking to the press and public opinion data that I showed there, just driving through structural reform and hoping that the, the service will kind of come with you, because it didn't. Um, so. So that, that's, the, that's the sort of background. 
The politics are now just net positive. Remember, we've got a new Labour leader to be elected. Um, it was interesting to me that in the last, if you, if you saw that, that media slide a couple, couple of slides ago, um, you know, the Labour fought a general election, I'm not being politically biased, I'm here to pass their work for, but you know, they fought a political campaign in large part on the NHS, led by Andy Burnham, who was, who was basically pushing an anti-private sector agenda, an anti-privatisation agenda, uh, which didn't really, I mean, as far as we know, privatisation was the privatisation, it was the use of the private sector to deliver services, which was slightly more than he used to employ them for, but that's about it. Um, it didn't really cut through, although it, it appealed really well to their core vote. Um, and that, that's all it really did, and I think they've, they've really learned that lesson. Andy Burnham being leader of the uh, Labour Party, of course, that, that's, you know, there's sort of questions there about how far he pushed that agenda. He was out at the weekend um, complaining about fracking and private sector firms you know, going to get involved in fracking. So, you know, he is somebody that, that likes to bash big business. Um, the political environment is just net positive now, that, that could well change. And I gather there's, there's a, a farmer presence in, in, in this audience. I think farmer is, is probably one of those industries that's going to come under the spotlight, actually, as, um, in the same way that the energy firms have, the outsourcing firms have. And the reason is, if you look at other areas of government, um, if you say you look at general outsourcing, the heat on outsourcing firms turned up in, uh, you know, and certainly when we measured it, it was in direct proportion to the level of cuts that were being made. So suddenly money was a much bigger issue than the than value you were getting. And, not, and then from that, it was, okay, what's the taxpayer bound pound being actually spent on? And when some of that pound is going to shareholders or, or profits of private sector companies, <coughs> their ethics and their behaviour and make up of their boards and, and who gets paid what, that suddenly comes into much sharper focus. So while, you know, again, Labour, before the last election, used outsourcers hugely and they got very poor value from them, actually, compared to, to recently, um, the, the current government got, got big bashing on that. And I think just with the NHS, um, in the, last, in the last parliament, of course, it faced, it faced huge funding pressures, but the line was always where well, there's extra money going in, there's extra money going in, and there's management costs coming out. We didn't really have a big focus on who's involved, how much money's going to them, and what value are they delivering. Uh, and just, just to flag, I think that's, a, that's an industry that will come under some scrutiny. Um, public approval is rising. It's sensitive, again, though, to spending issues. There's a big distrust, and that, that, that trend has continued against the private sector, especially big businesses. Um, so again, I think farmers are one of those areas, again, it's pretty ripe for um, a bit of kicking. Medtech, who I gather is another big chunk of the audience. I mean, that, I mean, from what I've seen, anything that relates to technology and innovation and data and doing things differently, <coughs> seen much more positively even by you know, the huge firms. So people do believe that technology improvements are, are an area where the government should be bringing the private sector in on a much bigger scale. So there, there, are some, um, there are some positives there. And the media environment, as I mentioned, there is a lot of interest in how it's huge, um, especially in gadgets and things that will change and save money. Um, consumer issues are going to be really, really big, as well as the value we're getting from people involved in, in services. So in terms of uh, sort of sales teams and stuff here, yeah, I, I, I know that you, you personally would probably want to get involved in shaping the agenda or, or monitoring and tracking political risk, but certainly somebody in your organisation should be, because it relates directly to um, you know, what you do and what appetite there is to, to talk to you and, and, uh, and ultimately uh, buy from you. Um, in order to shape the political agenda, or to at least help um, uh, help government kind of not shy away from pushing through reforms, we think it will want to um, push through and, and make use of guys like yourselves. You know, at the national level, we should be talking generally about innovation, quality, value. Uh, Jeremy Hunt will be doing a lot of the quality stuff and, and innovation. Um, Simon Stevens, more as I said earlier, a kind of management consultant type of approach um, to try and depoliticise some of the, the more controversial things. It's not that he's being used as a as a kind of 
you know, sort of punch bag, well, you know, to protect the minister from it. But it's, it's the sort of lurid, rather um, abstract, very political debate we have when a politician tries to front um, something like service reconfigurations compared to a doctor or somebody actually is we're talking about with the NHS and has a respect of them. Um, yeah, at the local level, we will see those debates around reconfiguration, staffing changes, the use of the private sector, um, uh, big change on commissioning support, probably again use of um, data companies. Um, again, that, that will go on at the local level because that can be a bit more uh, controversial in the NHS. Um, uh, you will see politicians across this parliament trying to keep those debates at that level. And at the moment, there's no appetite to row back from reform. <coughs> but re remember, remember the election. And this is why I keep telling people at the moment that I say, oh, you know, we've got the majority government. Um, there's a no-brainer that the private sector has to come to the NHS basically to rescue it um, from, from you know, the, the cost pressures it's under. But remember the election. They, everybody shut up about the NHS, and they shut up about reform. And they, all the small political parties, none of them talk about how they would deal with the funding uh, budget uh, black holes and uh, what they're going to do. Labour had a really broad thing about you know, merging health and social care and, and, and various bits and bobs. They didn't want to try and create a story about reconfigurating anything. Tories just shut up completely. Uh, Liberal Democrats talked to them about mental health and that's about it. Um, no one's really got a mandate for doing anything particularly radical or a mandate for, for pushing hard. So, you know, where if, you, if you do, if you believe you've got big changes that, that, that you need to be talking to politicians about, they need to be talking to you about, helping them, you know, you, you do have to think about how it sits with, with their, you know, the, the way they're going to play the, the political agenda of the next parliament. Um, public opinion, um, knowledge is actually very low about what you do, especially. Um, about the value, especially the pharmaceutical industry. Actually, this is, I know people that are in it will know this has been a problem for a long time. But I've spoken to several pharma things, and the industry guys always say um, uh, politicians don't understand that the profits that we make sometimes got to be reinvested. It's not you know, just making tons of money out of the NHS. Uh, they can't just fiddle with our prices and keep taking money off of us. But the, the knowledge about that is very, very low. Knowledge amongst the public is even lower. However, um, raising, I mean, I've seen data directly support this, that raising knowledge, especially in that area about the value you deliver, um, shifts approval quite markedly. But it, it's a tough sell because you, you do have to explain to people, you have to have a campaign. I don't think the trade bodies, I mean, sorry if there are people here from them, but I don't think the trade bodies do, do you any favours actually, because I don't think this, this sort of message is really getting out there. I think they're obsessed with trying to help with technical policy rubbish that no one really wants to listen to them on. And they're not doing campaigns and communications and you know, positive stuff that will you know, improve your reputation rather than you know, fiddling around with, with um, input on policy drafts and submissions. Um, if government wants to talk to you about it, they'll, they'll, they'll ask. You know, they don't need, they don't need, they don't need to have a policy function out there. Um, and the media, the media is the strongest by far strongest factor that influences um, politicians. When the media environment turns on them, that's when you get the very, very um, big changes in policy. Um, and, and, you know, I remember in the last part, there are recent examples where companies would get into a contracting relationship that would go a long way towards a bid, a tender process, and put a load of money in, and then, then have the plug pulled on it because of a couple of stories in the papers. Is that febrile? Um, media feeds off of the other influences I mentioned earlier, the politics, um, the public opinion. Um, they all, they're all kind of cyclical to media stuff, you know, public opinion, vice versa, and politi what politicians say. But it, it's the media that is really, really powerful, far more powerful in this country than people think actually involved in, in terms of policy making. And what always struck me as, as somebody in a policy making role, especially in government, uh, was was the the far greater influence media had than either backbenchers and, and people that government should be listening to, certainly because they've got direct constituency <coughs> to the electorate. Also among the civil service, the top, you know, the very, very top of the civil service were obsessed with media, obsessed with stories. 
what's the truth in this? What's that? What, where did this story come from? Um, so, you know, media is really, really important. And if you are one of those organisations that is active in communications about what you do and what value it delivers, it is really, really important to focus on probably media uh, more so than a lot of these firms advise you to do engagements with local MPs and stuff. I mean, that, that, that rarely delivers you any value. It, it, it's really at the high level con stage that you need to be focusing on. Um, so I'll kind of, I think I had 25 minutes, so I'll, I'll wrap up about there. Just, just to finish, I mean, that, the, the general message is that this parliament, I think you, you'll see very many of the, the same, you'll certainly see the same policy pressures that were the ministers <coughs> were in the last parliament. You'll certainly see the same appetite for, for changes to staffing, to the configuration of services, um, to the use of the private sector, to, to getting more value out of the drugs market, to getting much more innovation in from technology experts. You'll see all of that, um, but you will see it through a different political lens where um, the, the governing party in particular will be a lot more, I think, I think it's fair to say, a lot more savvy with that being kind of too blowing about them, they'll be a lot more savvy politically about what they can and can't achieve. They won't want to create a great big barn door for opponents to kick at, uh, like they did in the last parliament. Um, Labour Party is obviously the one to watch. I wouldn't be too worried about the SAP, <coughs> although they will create noise. Um, you know, they're not relevant still in large parts of the English NHS. Um, public opinion watch that, and, but, but the big one is media. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much.